Hey, it's Tony from Adafruit. And in this video, I want to talk about MicroPython. So normally I do like Raspberry Pi related streams. Uh, so this stream and maybe some future streams are going to be looking at a really cool project called MicroPython. And even if you are a Raspberry Pi user, stick around and check this out because I think you'll find this pretty exciting. Uh, so I want to talk about what is MicroPython, what it can do, show off some demos, and maybe help you understand if it's something that's worth checking out. And just at a really high level, MicroPython is a version of the Python programming language that you can use on tiny little embedded devices like for example, a little board like this. This is the Pi board, which is like a native MicroPython board. It's actually a little ARM Cortex, um, I think an M3 or M4 microprocessor, so fairly powerful little chip, but it runs a version of the Python programming language, uh, which is really cool because if you've used like Arduino or even just bare metal C, C++ programming, for embedded systems, you've you probably ran into some challenges. You know, using those low-level languages, you need to manage memory. You need to, uh, you know, use the right syntax. You have to compile the code. You have to upload it to the board somehow. Compared to something like Python, which is a high-level language or an interpreted language, uh, you know, Python has a much simpler syntax, very beginner-friendly, uh, very nice like error messages even an interactive prompt where you can go in and start running Python code and getting results back immediately. So really cool things. And all of that is possible on some of these microcontrollers and some of these small boards. And so that's what I want to show in this video is just some examples of what you can do. And it might surprise you. It's pretty capable as far as uh, what MicroPython can do for, uh, for you. So let's just kind of dive in and I'll show you something first that's um, kind of the, the basis of this video. So. I just uh, published a guide, and I'll put a link to this guide in the description below when this goes up on YouTube, um, so you can check it out yourself. But a little guide where I'm basically gonna uh, talk about the exact same thing here. So it's MicroPython Basics, what is MicroPython? And it's fairly short, it's just one page, a uh, bunch of questions, kind of FAQ style. So, you know, I just uh, answer questions that you probably have uh, primarily, what is MicroPython? So I talk a little bit about that, and then go into what are the differences between it and Arduino. Uh, and so that's what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna talk about you know what it is uh, like I mentioned it's a version of the Python programming language and if you aren't familiar at all with Python so here's a link to uh, just python.org that's the home page for Python and you might already have it on your computer right now so if you're using like a Macintosh or Linux machine very likely you have Python installed uh, just open a terminal and run Python and if you get something like this you've got Python and you know you can uh, here's your first program if you've never done anything uh, hello world print that out and hey, look at that, you're, you're a Python programmer now. And if you're on Windows, it's really easy. Just run a little EXE to install it and you're good to go with it. Uh, so definitely worth checking out, even if you're not interested in embedded systems. It's a very nice language. Like I said, meant to be very beginner friendly. So they're showing examples of Python code right here. So like here's a function to uh, write out the Fibonacci sequence of numbers. And so you can see it's very simple. There's not a lot of extra junk, I would say. So if you're looking at a version of this in like C or C++, you're gonna see like uh, curly braces and variables declared with types and all kinds of things. And not to say that that's bad or that, you know, using C and C++ is wrong. Uh, there are definitely valid reasons to use that. But as a beginner, something like this is a lot more friendly and approachable compared to some of those low-level languages where before you can even get code running, you've got to just understand the tooling and the workflow and compiling code and getting through comp compilation errors and what's a header and what's a CPP file and, you know, what are uh, objects that you've got to link together and just, you know, you haven't even gotten the code on the board yet and you've already learned all these crazy things. With Python, it's a lot simpler and by design, you know, it's meant to be more expressive and more powerful so that you can, you know, write just a few lines of code that do a lot of things. Uh, and another big important thing with Python is that they call it batteries included, where basically Python has a standard library that just comes with every Python installation. And that has tons of functions that you can use. So you don't have to rewrite all the code. Like if you're talking to a web service and you need to parse JSON encoded data, you know, in C and C++, you've got to go find a library to do that. You've got to go figure out how to include the library into your code. You've got to figure out how to compile it. You've got to keep it up to date. With Python, install Python, import JSON, 
you're ready to go. That's, you know, you've got JSON encoding and decoding, uh, lots of powerful capabilities. And so the standard library in Python is vast. It includes all kinds of things for manipulating data, talking to network services and network protocols, uh, you know, even just simple things like mathematics and stuff. There's all kinds of great functions. And so that makes it really useful because they want to empower you just right out of the box to get started and start using it. And MicroPython is really similar. Now, I'm not going to say it's exactly the same as Python. So, you know, a clear distinction is that MicroPython is a separate project from Python. Um, it's open source. It was created by uh, a couple people. Uh, you know, really awesome job that they've done to, to bring it to where it is today. Uh, there's a community around it that's starting to form, but it is a separate project. So it has a separate code base uh, and it, it has slightly separate goals. So it's meant to run on these little embedded systems, which means that, you know, maybe it doesn't have have all of the capabilities of desktop Python, uh, but it's got quite a few. Uh, there, you know, there's very few differences between normal Python and MicroPython. And honestly, the differences, I'm not even going to get into them because they're so technical, it doesn't matter. You're not going to run into them in most cases. Uh, but one difference that you might notice the standard library, you know, you just can't fit the same breadth of things onto these little embedded chips. Uh, but MicroPython comes pretty close. So like I said, JSON encoding and decoding, they've got a version of that in MicroPython. Um, if you're doing like regular expressions and string processing, something in Arduino that you probably think is like impossible because there's no function for that and good luck getting a library loaded in to do that. Uh, it's very easy in MicroPython. It's ready to go. It's right there. File system access. You can create files. You can read files. Even if there is no file uh, system or SD card or you know thing on your device, you can create files in flash memory potentially. Uh, and I'll show demos of all of this. So you know, very powerful, very easy to get started with and, and use. You know, just like the Python programming language, and meant to be that batteries included to have a lot of functionality built in. Um, okay, so enough kind of talking about it. Let's just dive in and run some demos real fast. So I'm going to show a few things off. Uh, and, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm hoping if you've used Arduino or, you know, other embedded systems, I want to show you that you can do very similar things with Python code running on these little chips using this amazing MicroPython project. Uh, and by the way, too, I'll put a link to micropython.org is the homepage for it. So this has some good links. Uh, but really check out the guide that I wrote because I tried to collect a lot of different resources here. I've got links at the bottom that kind of point you towards, okay, here's where you can learn more about stuff. Uh, here's where you can get some help on things. So check out this guide. I've kind of tried to distill everything you need to know to just understand what it is and what it can do um, in here. So, okay, enough talking. Let's jump to the workbench shot and let's remove that. Okay, so we'll go here. Uh, well, actually, let's go back to the main shot because we, uh, we need to see the code and things like that too. So, okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to start with this guy right here. And so look in the upper right corner. This is the Pi board. Uh, and I'll show you real quick a uh, link to it. Oh, I guess the rendering is a little messed up here. Um, let's search for the Pi board real fast. Uh, but this is the, basically the first MicroPython board that was available. Uh, and it's a really nice little board. So it comes uh, to you automatically loaded with the uh, MicroPython firmware. And so you're just ready to go. You plug it into your computer. And like I said, it's got a pretty powerful ARM Cortex chip on here. So very capable. And so let's plug it in and let's see what we can do. So I'm just going to plug in. It has a little USB port on it. Uh, and then I've just plugged this cable into my computer here. Oops, let's move that over. Okay, so I plugged it in. And then what I'm going to do here, so we'll clear my terminal. So I'm just going to connect because this thing shows up as a USB serial device. So if I look at my serial devices on this Mac, um, you know, if I search for all the USB devices, you can see this USB modem 143422. So let's, oh, we'll use the screen tool to connect to this serial port. Uh, so screen is just a real simple terminal. If you're on Windows, you could use PuTTY or I think Minicom. Uh, maybe that's not a Windows tool anymore. It's been a long time since I've done serial stuff on Windows. If you're on Linux and Mac, the screen tool is a pretty good one to use. That's what I'm going to use here. Anything that can open a serial port doesn't matter. You know, even uh, I think there's a web serial API now so that eventually web pages will be able to access serial ports. But for now, we'll use a tool. So we'll point it at our serial port here. And then the baud rate is 11.5200 baud. So we'll do that. 
And okay, this is pretty cool. Like we've got a Python prompt right here and this is all coming from this chip. None of this is running on my computer. This is all on this tiny little ARM Cortex chip here. And this is real Python. So if I want to do hello world, I can just say print hello world. And look at that, you get a response back. And it really is Python. So like you can do string formatting, for example, like if I wanted to print out, you know, hex number, and then we'll use the string formatting syntax and, you know, let's get fancy or let's put OX in front of it. And we'll say, you know, we're gonna put a variable in here and let's uh, pad it with up to two zeros, uppercase hex characters. And then, uh, you know, that's, that, that's the syntax in Python basically for the, the string format. It has this whole language. Uh, but this is cool because if you've ever tried to do this in C and C++, you're going to want to use like, you know, uh, printf, but on Arduino, you don't have printf. And so now you've got to like hack this in yourself. So, you know, watch this. So let's just give the format command um, a hex number. We'll, we'll give it a small one. Uh, you know, how about the number nine or something like that? Just because I want to see that it pads it with zeros. Uh, and so now I print this out hex number OX09, uh, you know, or let's let's go for a higher one, like 255 OXFF. So that's pretty cool. Like this is exactly how you would use Python on your computer. Um, it feels just like normal Python code, very expressive, uh, you know, very simple and straightforward to use like this. So this is pretty cool. Uh, the next thing I wanted to show, let's go back to the Python homepage here. So they had an example here of defining uh, the Fibonacci sequence. So how to print out. Let's do it. Let's type it in. Like, you know, we're just going to take normal Python code and, and throw it in here. So uh, let's define a function. Like, this might be blowing your mind already if you're used to Arduino. You know, you we're doing this all dynamically on the board. Like, there's there's no compilation. There's no upload to the board. You know, I'm, I'm going to define a function and call it just directly on the board. Like, this is pretty powerful and cool here. So, okay, so let's go back. And just to make sure that I don't make any embarrassing mistakes on live video, you know, we'll, we'll just type in exactly what we see here. So this is actually a, a pretty nice implementation of uh, the Fibonacci sequence because it doesn't use recursion, uh, which is just a different kind of, uh, I wouldn't say style of programming, but a different way to implement this, uh, which has some trade-offs. So they're actually just using a loop here. Uh, so we're going to start with values A and B, and you have to seed them with an initial value. And then uh, while A or while A is less than N, so basically this is a function where you're going to pass in, you know, I want the first, uh, the Fibonacci sequence up to the value like a thousand, for example. Uh, so we're going to loop through all the numbers less than a thousand. Uh, and then the way this works, you print out your first number, um, and then you increment the number. So the, the Fibonacci sequence, they show the example here, you start with zero and one, and then the next number is the sum of the previous numbers. So zero plus one equals one, and then two is the sum of one plus one. So that you get this value and you just keep going with that. So real interesting uh, mathematic uh, thing, but this is a real example of programming. You know, we're doing a loop, we're computing things in here. This is exactly what you would do with normal, uh, you know, code. It's just, you know, it's not necessarily a toy example here. So, okay, so let's finish this up. Uh, let's print out a, and then we'll tell it to end with a space instead of a new line because normally print adds a new line, but we're gonna keep this all in one line. Um, and then they do a fancy little thing here. You know, you can do tuple unpacking uh, where you've got like two different values here and we can assign them different values just with this comma operator. So, you know, if, if you're used to Python and I'll show you some more examples, like get ready to have your mind blown. Like this is, this is pr still pretty amazing to me how powerful, you know, I'm gonna show some examples in a second of defining like a Lambda function and doing functional programming on a microcontroller. This is pretty amazing. Uh, okay, so let's go back and so, and we're going to set A to the value B and then B to the value A plus B. So this is kind of the magic step that says, okay, just go in order computing, you know, the next value is the sum of the previous values right here, basically, uh, for this. And then let's see, they end it with a print. So this is just going to add a new line at the end. Uh, and then we're done defining this function. So let's call it. So let's call fib of a thousand. And hey, check this out. So we get a bunch of numbers here. And these look awfully similar to the values that we expected right here. So that's pretty cool. I just took some Python code, typed it into this prompt, ran it on this little ARM Cortex chip, and it ran exactly the way we expected. Um, you know, no drama here. This is pretty cool. Uh, so again, you know, just trying to show that you can run real Python code on a little microcontroller. 
Um, now this microcontroller, um, this has a little LED built in. So if I remember correctly, I can use it if I import this pi b library and then the LED I can say equals pi LED zero, I think one I have to do. And then I can say LED dot on and notice the red LED just turns on and then LED dot off, so it turns off. So this is kind of cool and something you can't do with Arduino. You know, I have this interactive prompt and so if you're learning about hardware, you know, maybe you connected up a device to this board because it has all these general purpose input and output pins and you just want to start playing around and talking to this device, you know, just open up this little interactive uh, prompt here. This is called a REPL, R-E-P-L, a read, evaluate, print loop, because that's what's happening here. You know, it's reading input that I type in, it evaluates that as Python code, it prints out the results, and then it just loops over and over, just waiting for me to print in or type in more Python code. Um, and this is not the only way that you can use MicroPython. So in later videos, I'm gonna show a better workflow where you can load things onto the board. Um, you know, you can have a, a file that's run that has your Python code. So this is, you know, more showing off that you can explore with code uh, on the board. And again, very powerful. You can't do this with Arduino. You can't just open a console and type Arduino code. You've gotta upload it. You've gotta, you know, push it out to the board. You've gotta compile it. So this is pretty cool for learning. Um, okay, so we showed off a few things here. Let's jump to the next board. So I'm gonna close this uh, terminal session and let's check out this thing down here. So this is the uh, Huzzah, Feather Huzzah ESP8266. So this is a really popular Wi-Fi microcontroller. Uh, and basically this microcontroller, uh, pretty inexpensive. So this board, um, the Feather Huzzah version, I think is around, uh, is it $15 if I remember correctly? Yeah, so about $16, uh, which for this style of chip, you know, this is a, a really good deal. Now you can program this with the Arduino IDE if you set it up and you install uh, some different tools and things. And so you can run code on here just like you're running an Arduino but you can also load MicroPython on here. So I've gone ahead and I've already loaded the MicroPython firmware on here. And you know, go to this guide if you're curious. And at the end, I link to you know, more details on the ESP8266 and you can see the documentation for it. That tells you how to load the firmware and stuff like that. Uh, but this thing's running MicroPython. So again, it shows up as a serial device. So if I look at my serial devices, uh, or at least it should show up as a serial device. Let me make sure that I've got it connected here correctly. So let's see, we'll put this back in there. There we go. And, oh, that's right. It doesn't show up as a USB device. So there's a different chip on this board. It's this Scilabs uh, USB to UART chip. So that's what it shows up as uh, for me. But let's connect to this thing. So we'll do screen. And again, we'll point at this device, tty.scilabs. And then same thing, 115200 baud. And okay, so you open this one up and it doesn't give you that nice little help, but just press enter and hey, look, I'm in a, a Python prompt here again. So, you know, print hello world and it's it's micro Python, you know, we're ready to go with this. Uh, so I wanted to show a couple things with this board. I've got some stuff connected to it. So I have, this is a DHT22 uh, style sensor. It's actually this AM2302 sensor, uh, but it's basically a temperature and humidity sensor. And so this is connected to the little ESP8266 Feather Huzzah. And then these are uh, a little ring of NeoPixels. So there's 12 NeoPixels here. And I'll show that you can light these up and control these all from MicroPython code. So this is pretty cool. Uh, so, okay, so let's start with maybe the NeoPixels first. So to do this, you import the NeoPixel library, and then you also have to import this machine library because this lets you access the pins that are connected or the, the, the GPIO pins on the outside of the board. Uh, and this is just standard Python syntax. You know, these are modules. We're importing these modules. Um, if you're really familiar with Python, like the dir command can kind of show you what's in a module. You can see like this has a NeoPixel object in here. Uh, they actually do implement the help function. So if you want help on this module, I don't think there's much, oh, it tells you, okay, you know, there's a class in here called NeoPixel. Obviously this is not the same as Python's native help command, which looks at the document strings and functions. You know, again, some compromises have to be made to run on these little systems, but this is pretty cool. Like you don't have this kind of help in, uh, in, our, in the Arduino IDE usually. Uh, so, okay, so let's actually create a NeoPixel object. We'll say pixels equals 
NeoPixel, and we're gonna use that NeoPixel class. Now it takes in a couple uh, parameters here. So you have to pass in a pin, and that's actually a, a class in the machine module. And the pin that I have connected to the NeoPixels, it's this green signal pin, is pin number 15. Now I'm gonna do something, this is wrong. I'm gonna just, uh, uh, I'm gonna leave out a parameter. So if I do this, Notice I get a nice error back. It's it through an exception. So there's actually exceptions you can uh, use just like in normal Python. Type error, function takes three positional arguments, but two were given. Now you might be a little confused. You actually just see one argument here, but in Python, because this is a class, there is uh, kind of an implicit self variable that's at the start. So, you know, even though you see one, Python actually sees two parameters here. But this is telling me that, hey, you did something wrong, you're missing a parameter. So this, let's go back and I have to tell it how many pixels, so there are 12 pixels. So I do that, okay. And now to light these things up, so, you know, if you've lit NeoPixels with Arduino, it's pretty easy. The NeoPixel library is excellent. It makes it really straightforward, but not as easy as this. So you've got, you know, just an array, basically, you can access any of these 12 pixels. So pixel zero equals, and you pass in a tuple, you know, three values, the red, green, blue values. So let's say red is 255, green is zero, blue is zero. You know, you don't have to mess with like manipulating colors and bytes and things, just set the components. Again, very expressive, easy to understand. Uh, you don't have to learn all these details about like, you know, types of uh, objects and stuff. Okay, so that sets pixel uh, zero. Now notice none of the pixels changed uh, just because you set this in the buffer and then you call the pixels.write function and that will actually turn on pixel zero as, uh, as red. And you know, you can control other pixels. So we'll say like pixel one equals, how about green uh, instead of red? And then uh, pixels.write and we'll see these go out. So hey, we've got a red and a green pixel now. And you can animate stuff. So let's throw a loop in here, you know, uh, an infinite loop while true. And let's, uh, oh actually before I do this, let's import the time module because I want to do a little bit of delay. You know, when I'm animating stuff, it might run too fast, so I need to slow it down. Uh, and we'll say while true. And then let's say, let's just have it light up the red pixel and animate it moving around. Uh, so we'll say, uh, well actually, instead of doing a while loop, uh, let's do a for loop. So for i in range of 12. So this is just the standard Python syntax, you know, going through uh, the value zero through 11. And then let's say pixels i, so this is gonna start with pixel zero, then move on to one and two and so forth, equals 255, uh, zero, zero. And actually before I do this, I wanna make sure, let's actually turn off all the pixels. So it has a fill command that can push out the same value to all the pixels. And we're just gonna send the color zero. So this turns off all the pixels effectively. And now let's say pixels i equals red. So we'll do that. Uh, and then let's do uh, pixels.write, so we'll light up the pixels. And then how about time.sleep? So this is just the standard Python function for uh, delaying for a small period. This takes a value in seconds, and it can be floating points. So we'll say 0 0.5, you know, half a second of uh, sleep time here. So let's do that, and I'll hit enter. And hey, watch that. So we've got our little pixel moving around here. So it's just cycling through all the positions, and it stops when it gets to 12. So that's pretty cool in my opinion. I mean, look at how simple that code is. It's, I, I love it because there's really nothing extra here. It is expressing exactly the intent of you know what I wanted to do. Like I clear all the pixels and yeah, maybe this syntax is a little bit funky. You know, it'd be nice if there was like a clear function. You could write that though. There's no problem with that. But you know, you clear the pixels, you set the current pixel while you're looping through, you know, all these values. You push out those color values to the hardware. You delay for a small period. You know, there's no extra junk in here. We're not like defining local variables and giving their types and all these complex things. Uh, so that's pretty cool, in, you know, in my opinion, that it's you've got this expressive power. Um, okay, let's do the DHT sensor real quick. So again, this is just a module you can import. So the DHT module is what they have. And you just need to create a DHT object. So I'm gonna create the DHT.22 uh, object here. And again, this has to take in the pin that it's connected to, which uses that machine class. Uh, so machine.pin, and it's pin number 12 that I have for this uh, hardware here. So I do that. And then the way this module works, you call this dht.measure function. 
and the first time you call it, it fails. Um, you know, again, this is all kind of in development stuff, uh, just because it's got to kind of synchronize. When it talks to the sensor, there's a very specific train of pulses that it needs to read. Uh, and so I think this initial read, it's maybe not in a good state. But after you uh, call it once, you call dht.measure. And you know, by the way, this threw an exception. Uh, if I wanted, I could throw this in a try finally block just like in normal Python and catch this and then maybe realize like, oh, ignore timed out error, you know, something like that. But anyways, you call measure and then you can just call dht.temperature and that gives you back the temperature value in Celsius that we you saw previously. Uh, and same thing for humidity. So you call humidity, that gives you the percent humidity. Uh, and that was, so every time you call measure, it just fills in those new values for that. So let's just do a quick little loop, you know, while true, let's uh, do dht.measure. So grab a new reading and then let's print out. And again, this is, I love, you've got this string formatting that just works beautifully. So we'll say, you know, here's your humidity and let's print out this value as a floating point value with uh, only two decimal places. So it's going to round up uh, and then you have to say F for floating point. Excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> Whew, live internet sneeze. I don't have a sneeze button, unfortunately. Uh, okay, so there's percent humidity and then let's print out the temperature. And again, uh, now I want to use value one and let's do the same thing, just two decimal places and this is in Celsius. So we'll do format and then I have to give the values. So I say humidity is the first value and then uh, oops, dht.temperature is the second value and then make sure I get all the right parentheses lined up here. And then uh, let's delay. So this sensor only updates every two seconds. So we'll say sleep for two seconds and then let's let it go. So, hey, check this out. Like <laughs> a few lines of code, we've got a temperature and humidity sensor and it's printing out these values here. Uh, and so I can, if I blow on this, we should actually see the uh, humidity increase here uh, and maybe even the temperature a little bit. So you see it kind of goes up uh, like that. So this is pretty cool. Uh, and it just kind of scratches the surface. So, you know, there's uh, other types of hardware that are supported. So all of the different things you can do uh, with this chip so you can control like the general purpose inputs and outputs, like have buttons and switches and relays and things connected. Uh, you can control those with MicroPython. You can talk to the analog to digital converter on this chip and, you know, hook up like a thermistor or a photocell and read, you know, those analog values. Um, you can talk to I squared C and spy devices, so other hardware, and there are actually libraries that people have created, and I'm, there's going to be a lot more libraries, I bet, over time, so that, you know, hook up like a little OLED display and talk to that and control it with a library, uh, but, or if you need to, you can talk to it directly with I squared C interface. Uh, so lots of cool options and things, you know, pretty much think of it as anything you can do with Arduino, in most cases, you can do with MicroPython. Uh, now, like I said, though, the big caveat is that this is interpreted code. And so that means that at runtime, this code is not, you know, the, the code I'm typing in right here, like a print statement, this is not something that the ESP8266 can natively run on its CPU. That print statement has to be converted into an assembly language or like a low level language, which are real low level instructions of like, move this bit into memory here or increment this value by one or jump to this place in the code. So all of those uh, low level instructions, you know, if you cr make the right you know, set of those instructions, you can implement a print function, but it's gonna be pretty complex. Um, so with interpreted code, you know, you have these high level functions like print and then something has to run and interpret that code and convert it into code that the CPU can run. And so there's a little bit of overhead with that. Like there's a performance cost, there's a memory cost with that. Um, so, you know, just to be aware, like compared to Arduino, where you're using C and C++, which has this compilation step ahead of time, which takes that high level code, converts it into that machine code, and then gives you an output file that is the machine code that just runs directly on the CPU. So there's no extra step there to convert code from the high level language into the machine code at runtime. Um, and, you know, there are trade-offs with that. So by using an interpreted language like this, you have the advantage in that, like, you know, I'm, I'm typing in the code and running it on the fly. I don't have to do that compilation step ahead of time. Uh, the code can be a lot simpler here. So, you know, I don't have to, uh, like, use this prickly syntax because C and C++, the syntax, 
is evolved a lot from the machine instructions and, 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 you know, language. And so a lot of that complexity creeps into the programming language, like all of the memory management and things like that, that you have to deal with is just because that's how the hardware deals with it. And so when you're programming at a low level, close to that hardware, you have to learn to deal with that. Whereas the higher level languages like this that are interpreted, they can do a lot of that grunt work for you and make it a lot simpler. Uh, so that's kind of the point, you know, I'm trying to get across here is that, you know, sure, uh, you can do things in the low level languages, but you can also do them in the high level languages. Um, and you might worry and you might think like, oh no, like this is slower. I can't have slow code, but you know, it's really not that common that you have performance critical code, like things that have to happen in milliseconds or nanoseconds. Uh, you know, in most cases, like I'm printing out this temperature and humidity every two seconds. So for two seconds, the CPU is just sitting there doing nothing. Uh, so this is a really simple program and it doesn't matter if, you know, these print statements take 200 milliseconds instead of like 10 milliseconds if they were in C or C++, you know, there's random numbers here, but you know, if it's an order of magnitude longer, it doesn't matter. You know, my program's not running that fast anyways. Uh, but if you do have those performance critical sections, so like reading this DHT sensor, like I said, there's a very specific set of pulses that it has to read. And there's like a, an 80 nanosecond pulse. If I remember, I, I wrote a driver this once I should know this it's like a 50 nanosecond pulse it has to read that's pretty fast and so you know maybe you can't get to that level of nanosecond accuracy with MicroPython code because you've got that interpreted overhead but there is a really cool thing with MicroPython just like the Python programming language or C Python is what it's called you can extend MicroPython you can write code in C or C++ write a function in C or C++ that has all of the benefits of the low level. Like, you know, you're running directly on the, the CPU. You don't have the overhead of interpreting and, you know, you can manage memory yourself. You can access the hardware peripherals and things like that as much as you want. So you write that performance critical code in C or C++ and then it can be exposed to your MicroPython code. And so that's actually what's happening here. When I'm calling dht.measure, that's actually invoking, um, at a, it goes through a few steps, but one of those steps is it's calling some C code that someone wrote that does that performance critical stuff. So, you know, even though MicroPython might not be as fast as Arduino uh, and C and C++ code, doesn't matter because in most cases you don't need it to be fast. And when you do need it to be fast, you can do that code in C or C++. So that's a really powerful thing that, you know, you can write your code, write your, your business logic or your, you know, your main program logic in this high level language. You get all this expressive syntax and things to deal with. Uh, and then when you need to, you drop down to that lower level uh, to, uh, you know, do more things with, uh, with lower level languages. So that's, you know, a cool example. Now, one last thing I'll show with the ESP8266. Uh, I'm actually gonna turn on Wi-Fi because like I said, this is a Wi-Fi microcontroller. And by the way, there are libraries to use that Wi-Fi microcontroller in MicroPython. So you can talk to web services, you can download data, can, you know, connect to a Wi-Fi network, uh, very powerful for Internet of Things stuff. And hopefully we're gonna look at that in future videos. Uh, okay, so I turned on Wi-Fi on the Mac and you can't see it, but this chip is actually advertising an access point, a wireless access point. And I've connected my Mac to it right now. And I'm gonna go to something called the web REPL. So like I said, you know, we've got the REPL right here I'm connected to over the serial port. They also have a web REPL. Now this doesn't look super pretty because this is all pretty early in development. This is like, you know, the very first versions of it. Uh, but I'm gonna click connect on this thing and watch what happens. Ask for a password, which I set ahead of time. It's Python on this board. Web REPL connected. So this is pretty cool. And this might be blowing your mind if you're used to Arduino. Like, good luck trying to do this with an Arduino. Program it over uh, a web page. So I've connected to, you know, this uh, web REPL. It's actually using web sockets. So there's an implementation of web sockets, at least a listener, on this little ESP board. That's pretty impressive to me. Uh, and I can run code on here. So, you know, I can say print hello world. Uh, and it's actually kind of funny. You can see in the background, uh, the code is actually, it's, it's showing on both of these terminals, but I can run this and get the result back. Uh, so, you know, everything I could do with this serial connection, I could do it also with this web REPL. And so I think this is gonna probably be a lot of the future of MicroPython is you've got a lot of these little boards, you know, various ways to connect to them, whether it's like Wi-Fi, maybe Bluetooth in the future, uh, connect them, run some code. So really powerful stuff uh, that, that you can do with this. Um, and one other thing I wanted to show real quickly too, if you know, if you're a normal Python, or I wouldn't say normal, if you're an advanced Python user, um, you know, like I said before and kind of hinted at, 
there is a lot of power with Python in MicroPython. So, uh, for example, like if you just wanted to print the even numbers from zero to 10. So, you know, an easy way to do it would just be like four I in range of 10. And then if I modulo two equals zero. So if I is even, if, if it divided by two, you have no remainder, that means you're even. Then how about print out I? So this is just a standard implementation. Uh, so you can see, you know, this prints out all the numbers from zero up to 10, uh, the even ones. Easy thing, you probably do this in programming 101, nothing wrong with it. Python lets you get a little fancier though. So like if I wanted, I could say, uh, how about a functional style? So let's make a list and we'll use the filter function and let's define a Lambda function. You can't do this in Arduino, uh, which takes one parameter. And if that parameter is even, it's gonna return true. So the filter function takes in a set of values. So like the range of you know zero to 10, and it's gonna apply this function to each value. And every value that this function returns true for, it's gonna pass on to the next function. So this is kind of like a functional style of programming. When I do this, look at this, I got a list of all the, the values all in one line. Like this is again, the power of Python that you've got, you know, this capability. And there's nothing wrong with either of these approaches. You know, it really just comes down to how you want to do this. Uh, and then, hey, if you're a more advanced Python programmer, you're probably thinking, why don't you use a list comprehension? Okay, advanced Python programmer, let's use a list comprehension here. So let's create a list, or actually, no, sorry, let's do uh, uh, for x, uh, x in uh, range, uh, oh wait, no, I, I'm trying to remember, what is the syntax for this? Uh, I think it's, yeah, x for x in range of 10, if x modulo two equals zero. So, hey, look at that, you get all the values and then you're using that fancy list comprehension syntax. So, you know, as a Python programmer, uh, I'm pretty darn impressed. Cause remember, this is running on this tiny little ESP and you've got this really cool expressive syntax that you can do, um, you know, your programming in. So, but hey, if you're a beginner, you don't have to get tripped up with this stuff. It's perfectly fine to use, you know, loops and basic things like that. So you know, I just wanted to show that even though this is micro Python, it's still Python and it's still pretty powerful. Um, okay, so we're running a little bit long and I'm gonna just jump to the last demo here. So I just wanted to show one more board and actually I'll close out uh, before I get to that. So I'm gonna show the micro bit and I'm gonna close out of this serial connection here. Uh, so Microbit is this guy here, and uh, if you're in America, you can't get this right now, unfortunately. I got this on eBay, so check out ebay.co.uk. Um, everyone in the UK in like certain grades, I think like, I don't know, ninth grade or something like that, every student got one of these, which is pretty cool. Like it's, that's amazing that they wanna give them. And this is just a small little board, uh, you know, very similar to a lot of the boards that we have at uh, Adafruit. It's got a chip on here you can program and it's got some things built in. There's a little grid of LEDs on the back here and it supports MicroPython and watch this. This is pretty cool. So I'm gonna plug this thing in and I've gone to their webpage here and uh, I'm gonna go to create code and they've got a, a really nice little system here. So you pick which language you wanna use. They have like a visual programming language and stuff. Let's do Python. Uh, we'll do a, a new project here. And they kind of start you off with a basic little starting script here. So like already your mind might be blown. Like we're gonna program this from a web page here and a pretty nice looking web page. I gotta give them credit, this is beautiful. Uh, but you know what? I think this is kind of where the future of a lot of this MicroPython stuff's gonna go. So even though it's really fancy and slick on the micro bit, you know, someday I bet a lot of the other Python boards are gonna be like that. Uh, anyways, though, so they start you out and they've got a nice little micro bit module that lets you do things like scroll a message on the, the LEDs that are on the back. And I've actually done this ahead of time. Uh, so it's scrolling this hello world uh, on here, but let's just see what happens. So, you know, maybe instead of hello world, we'll say uh, hello Python, just so we can show that this is different. Um, and then let's just click this download. So the way that the micro bit works, uh, one of the ways it works, it looks like a USB device, uh, USB storage device on your computer. And so when you click download here, it actually generates a firmware file that you can drag over to the board. So I'm gonna do that. I just have to open up Finder to my downloads folder. Uh, and so if you look here, you can kind of see uh, over here, here's the micro bit device that's connected here. And uh, I guess it gives you some little like debug info here. Uh, but if I go to my downloads, here's that script that I just downloaded. So I drag this over here. And then now you can actually see this flashing, it's programming. And then when I flip it over, we should hopefully see in a second here. So it's copying the file over and it's gonna program the chip. And hey, look at that, it's scrolling across. Hello, Python. 
So that's pretty cool. And it's going to show the heart message there. And again, you know, all just from this web page, I didn't have to install anything. I just clicked download and dragged it to the, you know, the, the machine. I didn't have to install libraries. It's all just there. You know, as a beginner, I can imagine this is much, much simpler than maybe the current state of the world with some of the desktop tools like Arduino and stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm not going to say that it's better and, you know, always better uh, than Arduino because, you know, again, there are very valid reasons why you might want to use Arduino. Like, you know, maybe there are performance issues or maybe there are libraries that Arduino has that aren't in MicroPython yet. So, you know, there is no best or worst. It's just a different option. And that's what I really wanted to get across in this video is that if you've used Arduino and you know you've done some basic things to control hardware, check out MicroPython. Um, you know it's it's a version of the Python programming language that runs on some boards. Now it doesn't run on all boards, so go back to the guy that I mentioned and I talked about um, exactly which boards it runs on. So you know it's it's not like you can take your Arduino Uno and suddenly uh, program it with Python. You know unfortunately that chip is just not powerful enough. Um, but check out all the chips that do support it. And I think you'll find there's a good mix of, you know, really advanced ones that are maybe a little higher cost and simpler ones that are cheaper and, and still just pretty, uh, you know, just as capable. Uh, so definitely check that out. Uh, but again, you know, MicroPython is a version of Python that runs on these little microcontrollers. And it's a very powerful thing, very good for beginners. But even if you're an advanced person, you know, and you know Python really well, you're going to feel right at home, like I showed before. You can do lots of advanced things with Python. Um, you know, you can create classes, you can create modules, you can go qu uh, crazy with it. Uh, so anyway, so I'm going to wrap it up. Um, if there are questions, maybe throw them into the chat right now, and we'll see uh, if we can get to them. Let me jump back to the main uh, headshot here. So let's see, and apologies, it gets kind of stuttery sometimes. Uh, oh, I just lost one of the uh, camera uh, uh, batteries, but uh, no big deal. Just a little dramatic lighting now. Sometimes it gets stuttery in this view, so I'm still troubleshooting Wirecast. Uh, but anyways, let's see. Uh, we'll look if there are any questions. Uh, buh, 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 buh. So some folks are mentioning they really like this, uh, which is cool. Yeah, I think uh, if you like Python, if you've used the Raspberry Pi and you program that with Python, I think you'll be pretty excited about MicroPython because, you know, uh, the Raspberry Pi is a fairly large board. And, you know, you, you can see those MicroPython boards are pretty small and nice and, and you know, very, very small systems, uh, potentially less power sometimes in some cases. You know, the, the Raspberry Pi can take uh, 50 to 100 milliamps sometimes where some of these boards can be a little uh, less power hungry so let's see uh, let's see oh some folks are mentioning like you know if you're a teacher and you can't install like the Arduino IDE yeah that's that's a problem like sometimes you know you're in an environment where you've got things locked down and you can't put different tools on there pretty powerful when you can just plug a board in and just open a serial terminal uh, and start talking to it so that's pretty cool it opens up a lot of good uh, scenarios so uh, let's see, what's your opinion? Uh, okay, so how would you describe MicroPython is maybe a question. Um, so the, what I'll say is go to this guide, so I'll put a link on here to this, but it is a version of the Python programming language made to run on small embedded systems. So, you know, I say a version of the Python programming language because it's not the full Python programming language. You know, you're not going to be able to take code that you wrote that runs on your desktop and immediately run it on a tiny little chip uh, because it doesn't have all the same libraries and maybe there are a few little syntax things that are different, but it's pretty darn close. You know, I'd say it's at least like 90% of the language is implemented there. Uh, so it's it's a different language to use to program these little chips. And, you know, Python is a much simpler language, but, you know, simple in the sense of simple to write, not simple in the sense of capabilities. You know, Python is very advanced and a lot of, you know, like, it always blows me away. If you've ever used Dropbox, uh, you know, the service to sync your files, whole thing is written in Python. The back end, the clients, all of that is Python code. You might not even realize it. Um, you know, that's that's impressive to me that services at that kind of scale can can use Python. So it's a very good language. You, you know, if, if you can build Dropbox with it, you can probably build an Arduino project with it. Uh, so that's what MicroPython is, a small version of it. Open source, you know, great community. So check out this guide. You can learn a little bit more about it. And my opinion of it is that it's awesome and it's worth checking out, especially if you're new to hardware, new to programming, uh, even if you're not new. You know, like I said, if you're a Python programmer, you're going to love this. If you're new to programming, you're going to love this too because it's really easy to use it. So... And then someone's asking, what's the difference between two versions of the ESP8266 firmware? Uh, that's a good question. I would check out the forums. So I link here to the MicroPython forums. Uh, just from the two versions you mentioned, uh, there's the, if, if 
so you, I see there's a version 1.8.3 bin and a 1.8.3 weird characters. Those weird characters are the GitHub commit ID. So it's basically just if it's got those weird characters after it, that was a commit that happened during that day. So, you know, it's basically grab the latest one is what you want if you're looking for the firmware for that. So, yep, get the latest. Uh, and then someone asked, uh, is it Python 2 or Python 3? This is Python 3 syntax on here. So uh, if I go back to the, well, I don't have it connected, but you know, if I try to use print not as a function, it's going to fail. And I think it's smart because, you know, hey, it's 2016. Python 3 is where we've all kind of moved and evolved to uh, for this. So, you know, it's, uh, I, I think it's a good thing they've gone the Python 3 route for this. So, uh, anyways, uh, so I'll wrap it up then. That was this stream on what is MicroPython. You know, just wanted to show the basics of it and really do a few demos to show the capabilities because maybe you've heard of MicroPython, but maybe brushed it aside and thought, ah, it's this early little thing. You know, I just showed off like five or six little demos talking to hardware. I, I don't think I wrote more than 20 lines of code. And, you know, I talked to a sensor, I controlled NeoPixels, you know, I uh, did some basic like math functions and things. So really cool, really expressive and really powerful. And like I said, this will be kind of the first and what will probably be a series of videos on MicroPython. And uh, check out the links in the description below. You can find this guide, links to all the things I mentioned uh, on here. And uh, check out youtube.com slash Adafruit. You'll find this video, all kinds of other videos uh, that we have up there. And then twitch.tv slash Adafruit. You can watch me stream these things live there. I like to stream a couple times a week on Mondays and Fridays. Uh, on Mondays, I like to do like a quick look at interesting Raspberry Pi software. I might start doing quick looks at like MicroPython stuff. So for the next few weeks, it might be a lot of MicroPython streams. Uh, so, you know, get ready, uh, buckle up uh, the seatbelts. We're, we're going to dive deep into MicroPython going forward. And then Fridays, I would do in-depth Raspberry Pi streams. But I think for the next few weeks, we're going to do some MicroPython stuff. So, you know, get ready. I think we're going to have a lot of fun with this uh, and really just explore what can MicroPython do? You know, is it um, maybe something you can use yourself to start building some projects? You know, things that you might have used an Arduino for, you can potentially use Python and MicroPython to do that. So really powerful things. Uh, so anyways, if you like this stuff, uh, comment, subscribe, hit the like button, you know, let us know this is good info and we'll keep uh, churning it out. So thanks a lot, everybody, and I'll see you guys later. It's Tony from Adafruit.